Hi everyone, this is Cody Stanford. I'm here with John Jacobs and Katie Barker. We're the creators of the Livable Future podcast. Today, we're telling the story of what's referred to as America's best idea, the national park system. In this episode, you'll learn about ecosystem science, what co-management practices of the parks look like, and learn how the national parks is an evolving idea that has grown with our understanding of science. So to begin, we'd actually like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are creating this podcast on lands that were traditional and ancestral homelands of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne people. We would like to honor these people and their contributions to this region with respect. Katie, thanks a lot for doing the land acknowledgement. I know that's really important for us all to remember. I'd like to continue with a quote from historian Wallace Stegner, who called the national parks the best idea we ever had. Absolutely American, absolutely democratic. They reflect us at our best rather than our worst, according to Stegner. I love that quote. And I do adore the national parks. But the national parks, like the rest of the United States, has not been a place of equal access or opportunity. And just to begin to understand this, I'd like you to take a moment to picture the many Native people with diverse cultures who called these lands home for generations. These people were stewards of the land, and they did not leave by choice, and that's important to the story of the national parks. A brief overview of the history President Woodrow Wilson signed the act in 1916. The idea was to provide the American people nature, unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. Now, the national parks cover 84 million acres in all 50 states with more than 20,000 employees providing enjoyment to millions of people each year. All of this information can be found at the nps.gov website. And I do want to highlight that the National Park Service is evolving to holistic land management, which is inclusive of the historical ties to the Native people. We discussed this with a professor at Indiana University who has had a 40-plus year-long career in the National Park Service. Dr. Brian Forrest teaches outdoor recreation, parks, and human ecology, has worked in eight branches of the National Park, and has been witness to a lot of growth in the park system. Dr. Forrest and I have an honest discussion about what's happening with the embrace of new ideas with a greater cultural understanding that's connecting more communities to the national parks. The national park system in the United States is mythical in a lot of ways, and we kind of swallow the myth, if you will, uh, that it is America's best idea. And on on many levels, I I think that's true. But one of my uh, literary sheroes, Terry Tempest Williams, says maybe it's not the best idea, but an evolving idea. And frankly, Mm. it's the evolution of the idea that I find really interesting today. Um, John Muir just had his birthday. Mm. Uh, Many people are totally enamored with Muir. And, you know, he did some really good things. He also did some really rotten things. You know, he, he did uh, have quite a bit of uh, disregard for people of color, for Native people, for Black people. And my biggest concern beyond that, which is kind of well, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Um, beyond that, he also had real disdain for park visitors, for the common person. Uh, people he referred to as um, the the world and his ribbony wife, untroubled by a spark. Uh, he didn't really think much of tourists. And uh, so the point being that there are these iconic individuals that we have elevated to almost uh, the status of a deity. And they're flawed. Uh, we're all flawed in our own ways. but. By challenging the origin myth of parks and the mythology of folks like John Muir, I think we're beginning to get a more accurate view of the parks and who they are for. In John Muir's vision, parks were for people that shared his mindset, that kind of wanted to get away from people and saw them, saw parks as a platform to get to a a spiritual pinnacle, if you will, uh, for his own use. 
that evolved over time and he had, he was more of an advocate for others, but it's hard to set aside that. And along with his vision that the parks were for people like him, that has been very much in play for more than a hundred years and the like him, like them, like me, it was basically white folks, uh, middle and upper middle class and higher white folks. And what we're now learning collectively, maybe as a nation that's beginning to learn how to listen, particularly those of us with privilege, uh, we listen to other voices and understand certainly there's a, a strong indigenous connection to these stolen lands that the United States government now claims. And there are ways to sort of re-endow those indigenous claims. Similarly, we're seeing a real movement of people on the margins claiming space in parks, claiming safe space. Uh, with the emergence of things like outdoor Afro and Latino outdoors and uh, LGBTQ groups that are really claiming parks as their own disabled hikers, unlikely hikers. Uh, we're seeing a real evolution. And what's really exciting to me is the National Park Service, an agency I have a great affinity for and, and a, a deep passion about is riding that wave. You know, we've talked for years about relevancy and uh, sort of changing the face of who we are. And I think we're slowly making progress and uh, opening the doors, if you will, for mm -hmm. a greater diversity of people and really beginning to challenge some of those status quo mindsets that kept us enamored with uh, John Muir and the like, rather than finding other voices that uh, share wisdom about these really special places. That really brings me to a point that I keep on seeing brought up a little bit more and more frequently is the idea of giving these parks back to the native people. I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, um, very contemporary idea. There's actually, a, a, I understand that there's a series of articles in the Atlantic right now yeah. on, on what is wilderness. And I know there's one that came from an indigenous perspective of, of returning these lands to uh, Native nations. I have not read that. And so I can't offer any kind of a, a, a learned opinion of that. I know there's a counter that came out in New Republic, perhaps as well. I've just been seeing them through social media. Yeah. Um, that said, there are some pretty exciting things going on and have been for a number of years of co-management. Uh, for instance, the, is it the north or the south, one of the units of Badlands National Park is now co-managed between governments, the Lakota mm -hmm. government and the United States government. And just yesterday in the New York Times uh, online, today in print, is a really amazing opinion piece by Women of Bears Ears National Monument in uh, southeast Utah. and. The article, the opinion piece basically talks about the rematriation of that landscape. And when Bears Ears was designated at the tail end of the Obama administration um, as a national monument, it was the culmination of international advocacy. And I say international because it was the United States government, but also uh, Navajo Nation, uh, Pueblo Nation, uh, Mountain Ute, and I think uh, another Ute Nation. There were, I think there were five Native Nations as well as the United States that had been involved in advocating for the Bears Ears National Monument. And what I'm an advocate of right now, I guess maybe as a, as a practical reality, 
but it's co-management. Um, certainly, these are traditional lands that have great significance to indigenous nations. They are also shared lands that have great significance to many other people. And maybe I'm selfish. Maybe I just don't want to give up that claim. Uh, but also, I tend to favor a more collaborative rather than all or nothing mm -hmm. approach to the stewardship of lands. Um, it's interesting. I've got a an indigenous friend and colleague here in the Midwest, a uh, member of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. And whenever we go for a walk, we always challenge each other. We It gets a little heated mm -hmm. and we always come away learning a lot. And she's challenged my thoughts on even using the word manage uh, because it's something that doesn't really exist in her language. And steward may be a better term that implies a relationship with as mm -hmm. opposed to lording over. Um, but I, I am, a, uh, I guess, an advocate of more collaborative approaches, uh, a multinational approach, if you will. So I've got some things to read and see if my opinion changes in that process. The guys and I were talking about this idea of co-management and sort of some of the benefits and costs of different approaches here. And I was thinking that, you know, another important aspect of this is that the National Park Service actually has, I think, more protection from the United States federal government for the lands than Native American reservations and sometimes tribal lands that aren't officially re reservations. There's a sort of a weird gray area that happens, and this is a product of a lot of anti-Indian laws from the history of our relationship. And these gray areas create an issue where it's possible for perpetrators such as corporations um, or criminals to do things on tribal lands. And there's this big, like, who has the authority to do something about it? And that's an issue, of course. That's <laughs> something that we ultimately need to address as well. And hopefully soon. But when it comes to environmental issues, corporations are essentially required to consult with tribal governments, but they are not accountable really for that. And they're, they don't need permission really from tribal governments. They just have to consult. So they can essentially say, oh, well, we consulted with them and then go ahead and do what they were going to do anyway. And this has happened with some of the pipeline issues. So I guess the point of bringing this up is that I think ultimately we really need to address these issues that create these gray areas and take away the authority from native nations to manage their resources and to be able to say no <laughs> um, and exercise their sovereignty. I do have hope, though, in the co-management system, because as Dr. Forrest said, we're finally at a point where the National Park Service and I guess society, non-native society, is starting to actually listen and hear these other voices. And I think that we can find a common ground here and work together to protect these important natural resources. And there have also been some cool examples of native, non-native alliances that have been getting some stuff done, such as the Cowboy Indian Alliance which sounds like a very unlikely mixture, right? But 
they are working together to carve out some common ground and protect some rural areas in the USA. I don't want to harp on this too long, but if you're interested in learning more, as I mentioned, there is the Native American Rights Fund and also the National Congress of American Indians has some great resources on their website. Wow. I love how much this conversation has taught me. I would love to see the National Park Service start to work more closely with Native tribes. I think that the Western style of parks management could stand to learn a lot about stewardship from America's indigenous people. It reminds me of a book I read last fall. Um, it's called uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. And uh, it was a killer book. Um, just yeah, about. Super good book. Yeah, the intersection of ecology and traditional wisdom. Uh, highly recommend. 10 out of 10. So this is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Look it up. Also, I recommend As Long as Grass Grows by Dina Gillio Whitaker, an amazing read, and talks about all of the basically centuries-long struggle for environmental justice for indigenous peoples in the Americas. Dr. Forrest, I really appreciate how candid you were with how the park system has grown. And I guess I want to ask, have you seen it grow any other ways? Yeah, and I, I can I can think about it on a couple of um, couple of fronts. When I started my career in the National Park Service in the late 1970s, and then for another ten or more years in the environmental field after I left the Park Service, we never talked about invasive species. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all about you know protecting everything and and creating these boundaries were ways to protect a piece of ground. Perhaps the, the broadening of environmental impacts, meaning that, you know, an impact here in this place has ripple effects that impacts other places, the transport of, of, of a species from one place to another that creates conditions by which one species may, whether it's native or non-native, it can become an invader. I mean, it becomes a bully. It becomes a mm -hmm. species that is not held in check by the environment that it now sits in. We are seeing that boundaries are artificial. And the way that has really affected the stewardship of parks is that we now have an ecosystem view. Mm -hmm. um, so look at things like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as a management idea that there's this park, but the park is part of a dynamic ecosystem that goes well beyond those political boundaries in the <clears throat> Uh, early 2000s, like 1999, and then in the early 2000s, I was part of a team uh, led by Gary Maclis, who you met last week, mm -hmm. who uh, started something in uh, the federal government called the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit Network. And these units based at universities were public and private, or public and university and nonprofit partnerships that would cooperatively look at ecosystem uh, research and technical assistance and practical applications of knowledge. And they were based on biogeographic regions. Mm -hmm. And so that view that has really changed, that it's not just this piece of ground, but it's the entire ecosystem and having that much broader view that I think maybe, and for me, it was invasive species that taught me that. Uh, but that view, I think, is a much needed change, having that much broader landscape view. Thinking about it on the, in terms of bear's ears again, mm -hmm. um, as a national monument, presidential proclamation uh, of federal land, the initial 
Antiquities Act of 1906 that Theodore Roosevelt lobbied hard for says that it is the president's purview to designate areas of natural and scientific interest, but the minimum amount to protect a feature. Mm -hmm. And so we have places like Devil's Tower, the first national monument designated, where it's a small piece of ground to protect that pillar. Hovenweep National Monument, where I worked, is only 800 acres, and it protects these amazing uh, ancestral Pueblo structures, towers on Canyon Rim. But it's just a little postage stamp here, a little postage stamp there. Moving on to the Bears Ears as a national monument is that knowledge that to protect the Bears Ears, which is a it's it's a feature, mm-hmm. but it's an entire ecosystem, and that is the minimum necessary. That then, of course, was reduced by eighty five percent by President Obama's successor, and I think we're now on the path to re storing, re, reprotecting the, the full designated amount. But it's really that landscape view, that ecosystem view that has changed. So from a management or stewardship point of view, that may be one of the most significant changes. And certainly as we uh, look at climate change, it's that broader view, that that understanding and studying and and, and managing for climate change affords us or it's just the magnitude of the problem. I love when Dr. Forrest describes invasive species as bullies. It makes me think of all the Russian olive trees that managed to outcompete the native cottonwoods across the front range here in Colorado. Believe it or not, this was only the first episode with Dr. Forrest about the National Park Service. On our next episode, we continue our discussion with Dr. Forrest and discuss the power of people's connection to place. So we actually didn't plan this, but this works out really well. We have mentioned several books to you this episode that we recommend you go check out if you're interested in the topics we talked about. And it turns out we have a spot that you can get them from. We are launching our own little virtual bookshop this week. And the link is bookshop.org slash shop slash livable future. What's really cool about this is that Bookshop is an online bookstore that actually financially supports local independent bookstores. So you can support your local shop while also supporting us. Find the link on social. We all want to give a big thanks to all of our listeners. Please share the Livable Future podcast with all of your friends and loved ones. Help us spread quality information with the people who matter most to you. Give us a follow on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you subscribe to your favorite podcast. Stay notified on episode releases and updates by following us on social media.